Dead bodies, like, um, for me, my experience, uh, three. Three dead bodies. About one month I've been sleeping on, I mean, along the river, in the forest, sleeping on the ground. We are trying to do our best, you know, helping these people that they are coming from far away. I'm going to go visit a little baby who was born in the camp right after his mother finished that terrible journey. We are in the Darien, but we haven't made it to the end of the road yet, where Yavisa is. We just left Metati, and we're looking for one of several refugee camps that are in this area. They've got so many that they went from having one refugee camp to having a whole bunch of them. And uh, so we're kind of looking around to see if we can find where the refugee camp is. We've been kind of standing around all day waiting for Centerfront and they haven't showed up. So we're kind of taking matters into our own hands. Better to ask forgiveness than permission kind of thing. And we'll see what happens. A few miles off the paved road, we found what we were looking for, a makeshift refugee camp called Las Penitas. The Centerfront troops working at the camp told us there are over 3,000 refugees in Panama at this time. The camp at Las Benitas held about 400 people when we arrived. They were made up of people from Cuba, Africa, India, and the Middle East, and even a few from Venezuela. This lady was from Cameroon. Okay, so tell me about what you saw in the forest. Um, okay, dead bodies, like, um, for me, my experience, uh, three, three dead bodies. What, who was One it? man, man, a lady, and a child. What happened to them? Um, I don't know, maybe out of starvation or stress. They had work, uh, maybe, yeah. Just exhaustion? Maybe, yeah. Uh, How far stressed? from the camp was, was that? We worked for six days, so I can't really estimate the distance, yeah, but we worked for six days. How hard was the trek? Uh, so hard, we had to climb mountains, here, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, water on land, like that. Did you get sick from the water? The water, yeah. yeah. Rashes on the body. And she might, yeah, she's just from the hospital now. Oh, yeah. yeah. She looks very Due tired. Due to all yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you knew before you started how hard it would be, would you still do it? Or would yeah, you? I will, because I have no choice. I can stay in my country, so I, I had to keep going. Where do you hope to go? America. And what will you do in America? Mm, probably school and then maybe find a job later. Do you have family or friends there? No family. No friends? Mm, no friends. Other Cameroonians? Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure you're all friends. All, yeah, all, all Cameroonians yeah. take care of each other. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me pray for you. Okay. Is that okay? It's okay. I will, I will pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would uh, just help this woman to um, trust in you. And I pray that you would watch over her, guide her to where she needs to be. Help your Have your angels come and camp around her to make her safe. And give her, uh, give her peace in what she's doing. Give her patience for the process. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, okay so talk, talk to me now. Um, tell me about what Centerfront is doing to try to help the people that are coming here from Bajo Chiquita. Well, we are trying to do our best, you know, helping these people that they are coming from far away. You know, from different countries, we are trying to find a way to... Um, they feel much better here because they have been... Um, um, in a bad situation, and because they all time they tell they tell they tell us all the situation they are, they have been living over there, and we try to provide them with uh, water, food, security, health. Well, now we are improving our water systems, and 
also we are trying to do, a, a, as you can see, our our facilities. You know, in trying to improve them when they come here. We, uh, we try to give them the accommodation they feel comfortable here. Okay. Uh, what do you do to register them and to check them? Uh, well, we got a, um, a system where we snap. Uh, photos in their eyes. Also, we need their fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So you're doing biometrics on them? Yeah, yeah. And um, then how are you helping them medically? Well, uh, as I said before, we are um, working with another institution that offers support to us too, because uh, there are um, hundreds of people that are arriving every day. You know, there are a lot of people that are arriving every day, and the majority of them, there are a lot of uh, pregnant women and um, many children, they are sick, and um, also they um, also they got like a stomach aches, you know, because the water. Mm -hmm. And we try to improve our system, as I said before, with water. I study English in the Defense Language Institute, where I was studying in Lagland Air Force Base, and that was a great experience. I'm very thankful with my teacher all day. Um, well. I'm doing, trying to do my best job here in my institution in our country. That's fantastic. Say, so. Tell me your name and your rank. Well, I'm Lieutenant Felipe Cáceres. I have been working in my, in my institution for 25 years and a few months. It hasn't been easy, but we try to do our best, you know, helping people. So we're back in the camp at Penitas, and a new group has just arrived. Uh, this whole truckload uh, is from India. And they're getting registered now, getting their biometrics taken, uh, fingerprints, iris scan, things like that, photographs, getting checked against whatever databases the United States has. And uh, yesterday there were only, by the, when we left here, there was only about 85 people left in the camp. But they had about three or 400 show up this morning. And that's how it goes here. You can have days where there are you know, everybody leaves and then all of a sudden, boom, there's 500 people show up. And it all depends on that controlled flow program that Panama has instituted to try and uh, manage the flow of people north into Costa Rica. Again, that's all controlled by Costa Rica because Costa Rica is the one who says who's going to go and who's going to stay. So I'm going to go visit a little baby who was born in the camp right after her mother, his mother, uh, finished that terrible journey. Can you imagine making that journey at nine months pregnant? That's unbelievable. So check this out. Oh, precioso. ¿Cómo se llama él? Darien. Yes, Darien. Pero she's saying that this, this is baby Darien, and he was born in the camp at Membrillo right after she, wow. his mother walked through the jungle. ¿Cuántos días para, para cruzar? Cinco días. Five days walking through the jungle, nine months pregnant. ¿Y cuántos días en el campamento antes de dar la luz? Tres días. So three days later, once she got to the camp, she gave birth to little Darien. So... This will be a, a permanent reminder for her of the hardship that she faced walking through the jungle. Now, she's, she told me that if she had known how difficult that, that crossing would be, she would not have done it at, you know, nine months pregnant. ¿Por qué no sabías la dificultad del, del, cruz, de, de la, del viaje no, no, no sí, lo, a ver, no sí te, lo sabía pero bueno, no me imaginaba las lomas no te avisaron sí, sí. pero bueno, las lomas estaban difíciles pero bueno. ¿pagaste a alguien para, para guiarse? No, no, los guardias solo nos dijeron nos guiaron ahí sí ya, so they didn't pay anybody uh, she didn't pay anybody she said people did tell them it was difficult but she had no idea how difficult it would be and so this other woman helped her give birth. She's a licensed nurse. And uh, de, de cual parte de Cuba? De la de Clara. Uh, es en el Del campo. Del centro, Santa Clara. Okay. En el, uh, okay. Y ahora, ¿para dónde vas? Bueno. Cuando, cuando está lista. Cuando el niño esté más grande, mm -hmm. vamos para los Estados Unidos. Van para, para los Estados Unidos. So they hope to go to the United States. And, um, you know, these people have, uh, they're, they're in a big hurry at this point. 
because they're afraid that the wall's going to get built and they're not going to be able to get in. And that's part of the reason that we're seeing people take these desperate chances to get to the United States now because they, they see the division that's happening in the United States and they are trying to take advantage of that division to get in while they still can. And so they will probably see a record number of people coming through the Darien this year uh, because of that. They, they say, it says in the Bible that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the United States is a house divided against itself. Uh, and little Darien is one little proof of that. So the question for Americans is, I mean, obviously there are needy Americans that we want to help. And you, you want to help the people in your own country first before you go helping people all over the world. And America can't afford to take everybody in the world uh, in. But at the same time, when you see little Daddy N living in a camp like this in these kind of conditions, what would you do? If you were here right now, what would you do? Would you just say, hey, too bad, lady. Uh, you're going to have to fend for yourself because we only help Americans. Or would you say... No, I've, I've got to do something to help this little baby. That's what we feel like. And those of you who have given to support this podcast and to support our, our ministry, really, our, our, our journalism and our, our ministry, are, are donating just a little bit. So we gave some diapers, we gave some formula and some vitamins and that sort of thing, and a little soccer ball for Daddy Ann's little brother so that we can at least keep them alive we can at least help them I, i'm not going to put them in my car and drive them to the united states i'm not going to help them get any closer because i you know that number one that would be human trafficking and that would be illegal but number two from an american standpoint i don't think it's it's a, the moral thing to do but at the same time we want to we want to help keep a little baby alive if we can and that's what we're doing so thank you for helping and um que dice a los que que regalaron estos. ¿Qué quiere decir a, a los que... ¿Ah? Muchísimas gracias. Que Dios los bendiga. She says thank you very much for that. Okay, so I'm in La Palma. This is one of the two ends of the road going south into the Darien. From here, you have to take a boat, actually, to the town of La Palma, which is that way. That way. Uh, I don't know. It's maybe a... 10 minute boat ride, something like that. You can see the boats here. I can turn around. I'm trying to be careful because I don't want to fall in the water here. There's no, uh, nothing to hold on to. And um, you see here, see the boats going by? See the boats coming in? Yeah, that's kind of awesome. But it's about sunset and we've been basically waiting most of the day trying to get permission to do the reporting we want to do um, and we finally got permission but it was you know like five o'clock in the afternoon so it's too late to do anything and man I'm trying not to fall in the water this is exciting Woo. I'll show you what I just walked down in a second okay I made it look at that I don't know if you can see, see this right here? Oh yeah, I just walked down that bridge. Of course, oh, look at Mark. <laughs> Mark is uh, sitting down on the bridge. He's, yeah, he's crazy. So anyway, this is one of the two ends of the road. The road splits at Metati and Yaviza is actually further south. So they call that the furthest point south you can drive in the from, from the United States um, because of the Darien Gap where you have to take a boat to get around to Columbia if you want to keep going south. This is the other point that's not quite as far south, but still it's the end of the road. And we just came down here to see it because I'd never been here before. You know, it's been interesting talking to these people today about just how much this migrant crisis is changing the culture here. And what I mean by that is these people are changing their way of life to accommodate thousands of migrants coming in uh, 
on a regular, I mean, daily basis. They're just every day. There's hundreds and hundreds of people coming in here, and some of the communities around here are Wonan and Embera. They're they're indigenous communities that live have lived basically like they did up till you know, I mean, 500 years ago. They they really have not changed their way of life, except for recently, they've had to. They, they've started to change their way of life because they're going from a primarily agrarian lifestyle to a lifestyle that they call it migrant tourism, where they're basically charging money to these migrants to give them a place to sleep, give them food to eat, give them transportation, guiding services, whatever. And the Panamanian government is really concerned that it is destroying a very fragile and rare indigenous culture, or several of them. And uh, I, I see where they're coming from there, uh, although you can't really blame the Wonan or the Embera for finding a way to make money. If they can make money that way, then I guess that's what they do.